Hello and welcome to Pulse Check with Archer Nursing, where nursing comes to life. In this podcast, you give us 15 minutes of your day and we'll take one complicated nursing topic and make it easy. Ready for nursing to be fun? I'm Morgan, and today we're tackling distributive shock. So as always, let's kick things off with our practice question to get this started. Keep your right answer tucked away. We're going to come back to it at the end of the episode. So the nurse is in the emergency department and has a client with suspected septic shock. The priority intervention for this client is to A, establish a peripheral vascular access device, B, obtain the prescribed consult with infectious disease, C, provide frequent updates regarding the client's care, or D, perform a physical assessment for the potential source of the infection. All right, so tuck away what you think the right answer is, but let's get into breaking down exactly what distributive shock is. I want you to picture your vascular system as like a giant highway. It's delivering oxygen and nutrients to your organs, like cars zooming along the highway to their destinations, okay? Oxygen, nutrients, et cetera. In distributive shock, however, all those highways are suddenly wide open. They go from like two lanes to eight lanes. Every traffic light is stuck on green. And that sounds good, but because we don't have that pressure keeping the blood moving, we're just wide open the oxygen delivery gets sluggish. It's all disorganized and we can't move that oxygen and those vital nutrients to our organs. So that leaves our tissues and our cells without the supplies that they need. At the center of all cases of distributive shock is massive vasodilation. The blood vessels widen up, the pressure drops and perfusion crashes. So Here's where it gets really interesting. There is more than one road that can lead to distributive shock. I'm gonna go over the four most common here. The first road is septic shock. This is most common, very deadly. You'll wanna catch septic shock fast. In this case of distributive shock, it starts with an infection. Could be pneumonia, a UTI, a wound infection. And you get, instead of like a targeted immune response, you get a full blown, massive, widespread inflammation. The immune response, it just goes like full DEFCON 1. It floods the bloodstream with cytokines. The chemicals are supposed to help, but they cause more and more inflammation. It leads to leaky capillaries and that key part of distributive shock, massive vasodilation. So you've got fluid spilling into tissues and not enough blood pressure to push the oxygen actually where it needs to go. We're trying to like fill up a water balloon with a hose that's got a bunch of holes in it. You know, nothing is staying in the system. All right, that's road one that can lead to distributive shock. Road two is our anaphylactic shock. This is the immune system's overreaction to a perceived threat like a peanut, a bee sting, or certain medications. We get an IgE mediated response, histamines are released, And boom, vasodilation. Histamines cause vasodilation. Our blood vessels widen, fluid leaks out, our airway can swell up, dramatic, life-threatening. Okay, so again, vasodilation, our road is too big. We are not getting oxygen and nutrients to the cells where we need them. All right, third, probably the least talked about, an adrenal crisis. This is the third way we can get distributive shock. We have a massive loss of cortisol, not enough of that stress hormone, and blood vessels require cortisol to maintain their pressure. So if we don't have it in an adrenal crisis, normally two-lane road goes to being an eight-lane road. We lose that pressure. We cannot get oxygen to our tissues. And finally, the fourth road, the fourth main road that can lead to a distributive shock is neurogenic shock. This one happens when there is a spinal cord injury, especially high up above T6 in the cervical region. And normally the sympathetic nervous system keeps your blood vessels nice and tight through adrenergic stimulation. But if that is cut off due to spinal trauma, then the vessels lose their tone. Vasodilation, we cannot get blood where it needs to go. Okay, so as you can see, 
several different roads and ways that we can lead to distributive shock. The common underlying theme here is that we don't have the tone or the pressure to push the blood forward. We've got enough blood. The heart is pumping the blood, but the pipes carrying their blood are too big. They are too big, they are too dilated, and they can't actually get the oxygen to the tissues. So we have shock, okay? So in distributive shock, you don't just need a bunch more fluids. You need to squeeze the tank. The tank is full, but we gotta squeeze it. We gotta vasoconstrict to get support and pressure back up, okay? So that's what your nursing interventions are going to focus on. Recognize those signs. We're gonna get fluid resuscitation, but we need to prepare for meds like vasopressors. And to give those meds, guess what you gotta do? You gotta have vascular access. That's gonna be your lifeline to giving the body what it needs to survive in, you know, crash circulation, okay? So all that being said, hopefully now you kind of understand distributive shock. We're going to walk through a real world scenario. This comes from my time in the emergency department. It was a remote like community access facility. So we didn't have a ton of doctors, a ton of resources, and it was a night shift. So we had a 40 year old male who came in and it was his wife who brought him in. Surprise, surprise. He didn't want to come in. He had been dealing with like a low grade fever, a cough, nothing alarming. But he goes to bed, wife goes to work a night shift. The wife worked at like an urgent care overnight center. It wasn't a full-blown hospital facility, but she had the night at that urgent care place. And when she came home from her night shift, he was confused. He was burning up. He had a really high fever and she knew something was not right. He was like not coherent in her responses. So she drags his butt in to the emergency department. I am there doing triage. So I'm getting his vital signs and figuring out like what room am I going to send him to. Here's what his vital signs are. Pulse 145, BP 85 over 40, respirs at 26, and his temp is at 104 Fahrenheit. Oxygen, lastly, 88% on room air. All right, so what are we worried about here? We got to rewind here, look under the hood. Remember, septic shock is a type of distributive shock. That is when the body's blood vessels lose their tone. They get super leaky. You know, somebody like pulled the fire alarm and it opened up all of the fire hydrants. Blood is just pouring out to the wrong places. and There's not a left to keep the pressure up and get that oxygen to the tissues. What triggered the alarm in this case was an infection. It looked really innocuous at first. This isn't kind of your classic septic shock picture. He had a cough, you know, he had a mild, you know, flu, fever, whatever. And then really quickly overnight, boom, he got super sick. So what happened, those chemical messengers, those cytokines, they're meant to help, but they went way overboard. They went into a full body fire drill. Everything got chaotic. They caused the blood vessels to dilate. That lowered the blood pressure. The capillaries got leaky. That caused swelling and organ dysfunction. And the heart was like, oh my gosh, my blood pressure is really low. I need to pump harder and faster to get this blood out. So that heart rate went up. That's why we saw that kind of classic pairing of a low blood pressure and a high heart rate. The body was trying to compensate for poor perfusion. But he's warm. He's not pale and clammy. He's not, you know, got low pulses. He's not modeled. None of those typical signs of poor perfusion because he's vasodilated. So all that blood is like up on the surface. It's not doing any good, but it's kind of misleading as a new nurse when you're like, he's got fine perfusion. Like all the P's, the pulses, the he's not pale. He doesn't have pallor. He's not modeled. Like all of that is fine but it's due to the vasodilation. The vasodilation, blood is kind of on the surface, not in the blood vessels, perfusing the vital organs like we need, okay? So why is he confused? Well, his brain's not getting enough oxygen. Why has he got a high respiratory rate? Well, the lungs are trying to blow off carbon dioxide and deal with the acidosis that's developing due to the fact the dude's going into shock since he's not getting oxygen to his cells, and his cells are going into anaerobic metabolism. Why is his oxygen saturation low? 
poor oxygen delivery. You know, everything's dilated, blood is out, you know, not where it's supposed to be, not getting to the cells. Okay, so this is classic septic shock infection, sets off the whole body situation here. But remember, there are other ways we can get distributive shock. The anaphylaxis, where we have the allergen and triggers a massive histamine release. The neurogenic shock, where we get spinal cord injuries. And the adrenal crisis, where we lose cortisol and then our blood vessels can't maintain pressure without it. This case was clearly sepsis, but for all of these different roads, they lead us to a similar situation. We don't have enough pressure to deliver oxygen to our tissues and that leads to shock. So let's wrap this episode up by bringing it back to our practice question and see now if you know what to do. Remember, you're in the ED, you've got somebody, and they are suspected to have septic shock. So what is your priority intervention? Your first option, get a PIV, establish peripheral access. Your second option, obtain the prescribed consult with infectious disease. I mean, they are septic after all. Third, provide frequent updates regarding the client's care. Fourth, perform a physical assessment for the potential source of the infection. So tell me, scream it out loud. If you're driving in your car, wherever you're at, write it down in your notebook. What do you think the right answer is? Priority intervention in suspected septic shock. And I hope you said, A, establish that PIV. When we are dealing with any type of distributive shock, We've got vessels that are vasodilated to the point where we cannot deliver oxygen to the tissues. The blood pressure is tanking. Organs are not getting the oxygen that they need. And if we cannot deliver fluids, antibiotics, vasopressors, then we're not going to be able to do nothing for this client, okay? Getting those IV lines in and doing it fast is the absolute first priority. Ideally, we really want two large bore IVs, one for fluids to restore volume, one for vasopressors. And if it's septic shock, we're going to need some antibiotics. Broad spectrum antibiotics need to be started in the first hour. Okay, now all of our other answer choices here, the PIV, the consult with infectious disease, the updates. They're not wrong. Those are all perfectly fine things to do and they have their place, but they don't come first, okay? We're gonna consult ID, but not before we stabilize the client. We're gonna keep family members updated, but not before we save the client's life. And yeah, we're gonna hunt down the source of the infection. But to do that, we gotta get our lines in and we got to get our life-saving treatment started, okay? So get the access and then everything else can follow right future nurses that is a wrap if you found this pod helpful i'd love to continue supporting your nursing journey through nursing school the nclex continuing ed and beyond archer nursing has you covered with on-demand video lectures high yield question banks live case study reviews and so so much more we want to help you master tough concepts and make it fun so join us over at archerreview.com Follow us on socials at Archer Nursing for more free nursing tips and study resources. Thanks for tuning in to Pulse Check with Archer Nursing. I'm Dr. Morgan Taylor, and I'll see you back next time.